Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on building a data lake on AWS. First up, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I know it's a busy work day, so thanks for taking time and joining us today. Uh, when we look at our customers uh, who are migrating to AWS, right? So they got a lot of reasons to migrate to AWS. So um, costs, cost savings, uh, agility, uh, innovation, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, one of the primary reasons uh, once they migrate to AWS, what they uh, do on the platform is to start innovating uh, quickly and data becomes a, a key driver to uh, innovate, right? Uh, so we have tons of customers who leverage the platform to uh, to innovate and leverage data to take uh, decisions for their business. Over the next 90 minutes, uh, we'll talk about how the AWS platform is helping customers to build a data lake that helps businesses to move quickly and make decisions based on data. Uh, I'm, I'm Raghuraman Balachandran. Uh, I currently work as a big data solutions architect with Amazon Internet Services Private Limited. And I'm joined today by a guest speaker who's going to share uh, how they have built a data lake on the AWS platform. If I go back to uh, how traditionally analytics used to look, uh, most of us uh, uh, would relate to this kind of a pipeline, right? So where uh, you have various data sources, uh, you collect data from various data sources, uh, you perform your um, uh, ETL uh, on those data, and then uh, feed the data into your data warehouse, which becomes your central repository. And uh, you use your favorite uh, business intelligence tool to uh, connect to your data warehouse and uh, uh, start making analysis and insights out of your uh, data, right? Uh, if you look at this model, uh, this model worked very well for relational data, uh, where data is more structured and you have got uh, schema uh, well-defined prior to loading your data into the data warehouse. Uh, in terms of the volume of data, this model worked very, very well for uh, terabytes to sometimes petabytes of uh, scale, right? Um, and in terms of the use cases uh, uh, that typically uh, gets delivered through this model is pretty much your operational reporting and ad hoc reports kind of use cases, right? And uh, you need initially a lot of uh, investments in terms of CapEx investments, and typically this used to uh, range in the order of ten to fifty thousand dollars per terabyte per year, right? Now, if I look at the data lake model, data lakes kind of extend the this traditional approach, where you still continue to collect data from uh, those different data sources, like your OLTP systems and CRMs and ERP, but you also start collecting data from these new data sources, which are your mobile devices, your uh, server logs, your IoT devices, your social uh, feeds, and so on and so forth, which feeds into your data lake. And beyond business intelligence and reporting use cases, you now start uh, uncovering new use cases like your big data processing, your near real-time use cases, and uh, more importantly, what's happening these days in terms of machine learning-driven use cases, right? Uh, so this opens up to a lot of new different use cases, which the data lake now starts feeding into. In terms of uh, comparing that with the traditional model, the data lake model uh, helps you collect both relational and non-relational data. And in terms of the volume, uh, you can go all the way up to exabytes of data, right? It can scale to any amount of data. And one of the key differences here is that this kind of a model allows you to use uh, diversified analytical engines. You're no longer just restricted by a data warehouse, but Rather, you would be able to use multiple analytical engines, depending upon what type of workload you want to run, and start making different types of analysis on your data, right? Uh, and from a cost model, this helps you to keep your uh, cost low from a storage perspective and analysis perspective. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, uh, Netflix uh, uh, because they are one of our great partners um, and they kind of uh, use our platform at scale, right? Um, I, I brought this particular uh, use case specifically because I think a lot of us would relate to Netflix. Uh, um, I'm sure a lot of us are a uh, fan of uh, Netflix uh, for the content that they uh, deliver to us. Uh, one of the important things uh, that I want to call out on this particular slide is what you see at the 
uh, bottom portion of the slide, right? Uh, that's their uh, recommendation engine at working. Uh, and I believe personally that uh, one of the reasons why Netflix is so popular is that their recommendation engine is just awesome, right? Uh, they keep recommending a lot of uh, awesome content that uh, we all love to watch and we continue to basically um, watch their platform. If you look at uh, that particular recommendation engine, uh, uh, Netflix can no longer just rely on uh, traditional data sources like uh, your databases, which collect you know, uh, your profile information and so on and so forth, but they have to tap into a lot of different signals in terms of what user is watching, um, are you a user who tries to binge watch uh, a lot of things together or do you tend to watch at a particular time of the day? So those are the different data sources, right? These, these data is coming from different data sources like your mobile devices, your, your video player, uh, when do you pause, uh, which, which videos do you watch and so on and so forth. These are different types of signals which are very, very different from your traditional data sources. And uh, if you're trying to innovate, you got to look at those different type of signals to innovate on the platform, right? Um, it's, it's just not Netflix. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the platform, we've got like tons of customers who are doing very, very innovative things on the analytics side of things, right? Um, so this is basically a limited set of customers um, uh, whom we can talk about in terms of what they're doing on the uh, analytics side of things on the AWS platform. So you see here a wide range of customers, be it uh, large startups um, to even very large enterprises building their analytics workloads on the platform. So for example, you've got like very large regulated enterprise customers like uh, the FINRAs and NASDAQs of the world uh, to even very large uh, consumer business startups like your um, Lyft and Yelp and uh, Airbnb and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so all of them are doing very, very innovative things on the uh, AWS analytics uh, platform. I specifically picked up few customer uh, customers to talk about because I found them uh, very interesting. The first one is um, is NASDAQ, right? Um, most of us would be aware of NASDAQ, so they operate um, uh, multiple uh, financial exchanges across the world, and they process tons of data, right? So all the transactions that happens on these exchanges go via NASDAQ. And uh, they had an on-premise um, uh, on premise data warehouse appliance, which they have been using for many years. And they wanted to move to a modern data platform um, to analyze all their uh, data, the, the data that they've collected over many years. So if I look at the pipeline that they build out, uh, so what they do is uh, they, they have like a lot of operational databases, uh, which are uh, deployed across their many exchanges. Um, they collect data from all those operational databases and also from various flat files uh, and then push all that data into uh, S3 and then they use a combination of uh, EMR and Redshift to start processing uh, all that data, right? Uh, if you look at the scale that they are uh, operating at, they are operating at about ingesting 4.8 billion rows per trading day, right? And ingest all that through this pipeline and start making some analysis out of that. Uh, don't worry about these terms like EMR and Redshift. I'm going to uh, demystify all of those and then help you understand what these services mean, how you can leverage that, right? Uh, the next customer that I uh, thought I would share with you guys is uh, DataZoo. So DataZoo is, a, uh, is an ad tech uh, company uh, spun out of MIT Labs, and they currently provide a petabyte scale digital marketing platform. Uh, so what they do is they they primarily deal with uh, uh, ads that we see across the internet. So they deal with billions of impressions uh, that gets delivered to various uh, websites and mobile devices. And they uh, they typically deal with petabytes of data um, in their platform, right? If, if you look at how they went about, you know, understanding which ads are working, which ads are relevant, which ads need to be served to end users, uh, they, they feed all those near real-time data from uh, multiple CDN providers and real-time bidding engines and their retargeting platform into, into Kinesis, which is basically a streaming ingestion service that AWS offers. Um, and then they leverage uh, Spark on EMR to perform their uh, ETLs and attributions and uh, uh, machine learning use cases and feed that all that into S3 
to which they connect various third party visualizations and reporting engines to start making uh, analysis of the data right uh, another customer uh, a very interesting customer is 20 21st century fox uh, i'm sure all of us uh, uh, know who this customer is um, they're into the uh, movie business uh, and they operate one of the largest movie studios in the world right uh, they regularly process hundreds of terabytes of data uh, every day. And uh, in terms of the query volumes that they run on the data, it, it goes all the way up to 25,000 25, queries per day, right? Uh, so they had a legacy data platform, which, were, which, was, not, um, which was not meeting these uh, demands, the struggling to scale and lots of performance challenges. And they moved into the AWS uh, analytics platform and built a data lake on top of uh, S3. Right. Um, again, if you look at their pipeline, uh, they uh, they use uh, one of our partner tools, Informatica, to collect data from various data sources and feed all that data into uh, S3. Uh, that's where they have built their data data lake. Um, and then they use uh, AWS Glue, which I'm going to talk about in a while, uh, to catalog all that information and run ETLs on top of that data and feed that data into um, Redshift and EMR and uh, use MicroStrategy to start making uh, visualizations and uh, insights out of that data, right? So those are the uh, three use cases that I thought I'll, uh, I'll call out, but if you go to our uh, uh, big data website, you will see a number of such different customers doing uh, different interesting use cases on the AWS platform, right? So one common pattern that you would see is that a lot of these customers built a data lake on top of S3, and they used a combination of uh, services like Redshift and EMR and Glue and Kinesis to uh, start making their uh, decisions, right? So, so what are the uh, what are the characteristics of a data lake? So, why did these customers build out using a combination of these different services, right? So, if I look at uh, uh, a data lake and call out some specific characteristics, I would probably call out four important characteristics of a data lake. Uh, the first thing is uh, obviously collect anything and everything, right? So your data lake should be capable of collecting data from various data sources. Uh, so some could be uh, real-time data sources, some could be batch data sources, some could be your databases, some could be your IoT devices. So your data lake should be capable of collecting data from all these different types of data sources and durably store them and make it available for analysis. And once you're able to collect the data, you should be able to dive in anywhere into that data lake, right? So what I mean by diving in anywhere is that some use cases needs you to look at just aggregated data sets at a very high level. And some use cases would require you to dive very deep and look at data in much more granular level. Uh, for example, your machine learning type of use cases requires you to operate at the raw data level to build your machine learning models, right? So your data lake that you're building should be allowing these different types of use cases to dive in at whatever granularity that they would like to dive in. The third characteristic is flexible access mechanisms. Because you're going to dive in at different granularity, you would probably end up using different uh, combination of tools Tools. So you would need flexible access mechanisms that allows different people to use different tools to start looking at the data. And lastly, uh, being future-proof, right? So when you start building out your data lake, not all the use cases are uh, are, are visible when you're building your when you're starting to build your data lake, right? You would probably know a few use cases that your business currently wants, and you would go and build out. But the moment you open up your data lake to your business, they would start coming uh, coming back to you saying that here is a new use case that I want to go and do it, right? So your data lake should be flexible enough uh, to be ready for the future, where when new use cases evolve, you should be able to readily um, uh, evolve your data lake as well to meet those uh, new use cases, right? So what we'll do over the next uh, 30 minutes or so is to look at each one of those characteristics and how you can address every such characteristic by building out a data lake on the AWS platform. So let's jump into the first characteristic, which is the collect anything aspect, right? So when I look at the collect anything aspect, uh, we see an increasing pattern where 
Amazon S3 is becoming the uh, underpinning service for building your data lake on the AWS platform, right? Um, I'm, I'm fairly confident that most of you know what Amazon S3 is. If you're not aware, Amazon S3 is um, a simple storage service, which is our storage service. Uh, this service is one of our earliest services. It's been uh, operating for the last um, 11 plus years, right? And it's primarily an object store uh, in which you can go and store any kind of binary object, right? Uh, S3, uh, from a storage perspective, is built for any scale, right? Uh, over the last 11 plus years of operations, uh, customers have used S3 to store all types of data. And if I look at the service today, it currently stores trillions of objects, exabytes of data, and regularly peaks at more than a million requests per second, right? That's the scale at which S3 uh, operates today. It is built to store any amount of data, right? So as a customer, you can go to the service and start very small. You can start with, let's say, an empty bucket, which doesn't contain anything, and seamlessly scale to terabytes and petabytes and exabytes of data on that particular service, right? It will continuously scale depending upon your requirement. The other thing is uh, S3 allows you to connect multiple analytical engines, and I'll talk about that uh, uh, going down the slides, uh, where you can connect multiple analytical engines to S3 and start uh, processing the data, right? Uh, S3 allows you to operate in a highly decoupled compute and storage architecture, right? So we'll, we, we covered the scale aspect, right? And one of the other important things from a data perspective is the durability aspect, right? So it's not good enough if you are just able to ingest data and collect data. It's also important that you are able to durably store it, make sure that data is always available for your analysis, right? So S3 is designed for 11 nines of durability, right? And so that's 99 dot so many nines after that, right? Um, so that provides an extreme amount of durability for your data so that you can be confident that uh, your data is durably stored on the service, right? And S3 as a service is multi-AZ uh, by default, right? So when you create your bucket um, and store your object within the bucket, it is distributed It is distributed across multiple availability zones in a single region by default, right? And just to give a bit of context about availability zone itself, uh, each availability zone in turn is one or more data centers. Right. So if I, for example, take Mumbai as an example, uh, there are multiple availability zones within Mumbai uh, and each availability zone in turn is one or more data centers. Right. So when you store your data in S3, it's replicated across those multiple data centers and multiple availability zones within Mumbai. Right. All that happens automatically behind the scenes without you worrying about all the heavy lifting. Uh, S3 also offers you multiple storage tiers, which you can use to optimize uh, your price and performances, right? So by default, uh, the storage class is S3 standard, which offers you that 11 inch of durability uh, for your data. Uh, but in addition, you've also got other uh, storage classes like S3 standard infrequent access, S3 one zone infrequent access, and Amazon Glacier, which is for your uh, cold storage, right? Now, why is this important from an analytics perspective? So all of us would agree that uh, uh, data typically arrives hot and data starts aging after a point of time, right? Uh, so you probably have hot data living for about a month and after a month, that data starts becoming slightly warm. And then after, let's say, a few months down the line, it starts becoming cold, right? And you are no longer actively analyzing that data. So what you could do with S3 is that at a bucket level, you can start setting up what is called as a life cycle policy. So you could say that um, keep data in S3 standard for a month, after a month, move it to S3 uh, infrequent access, and after three months, move it to Glacier, and after a year, uh, delete that data, right? It's a one-time configuration that you do at a bucket level, and the service automatically takes care of transitioning the data across these different uh, storage classes. What you benefit is that these different storage classes are priced at different price points because they offer different levels of durability and availability, and you can automatically enjoy cost savings by 
moving data across those different data cla data storage classes right and lastly one of the important things uh, from again analytics perspective is that um, making sure your data is kept in open data formats right uh, because s3 is an object store it doesn't really dictate any specific formats in which you have to store your data you could store any kind of binary objects in s3 and from an analytics perspective it's important that uh, you are keeping data in an open data format formats like your CSVs and JSONs um, or even um, analytics optimized formats like your Parquet and ORC and Avro so that you are able to use a diverse set of analytical engines which or, which operate on open data formats and you can keep your data in open data formats right so that's also important from an analytics perspective so S3 allows you to keep data in that open data format and you can use a combination of different engines like your um, uh, Hadoop engines like your Presto and Spark uh, and readily query that data that is available on S3. Awesome. So we, we saw about uh, how S3 can be leveraged as the underlying uh, storage for your data lake story. So what we will do now is over the next 30 minutes, we'll start putting together the pieces that forms your overall data lake architecture, right? So imagine this uh, this universe where you're going to have multiple components of your data lake and S3 kind of sits at the center where it, uh, uh, it acts as your centralized storage uh, for storing all your data, right? So we will come back uh, to this particular architecture diagram and start putting together other pieces uh, in this uh, architecture diagram, right? Okay, so we looked at uh, S3, which uh, forms as your uh, centralized storage. Now, how do you collect your data and uh, feed all the data into your uh, S3 data lake, right? You've got lots of options here, depending upon from where you are uh, ingesting your data, right? Uh, you've got lots of options to ingest from um, uh, on-premise data centers. So, for example, if you're if you're looking for connectivity, there are options options like Direct Connect, which allows you to establish a uh, dedicated network from uh, on-premise data centers to uh, AWS, right? Uh, if you're looking at migrating data from on-premise data centers to the AWS platform, there are tons of options there as well, right? Where uh, you can order an appliance called as Snowball, uh, which is actually a physical appliance. It comes with uh, um, uh, 80 to 100 terabytes of data storage on that. You can order the appliance, we will ship it to your data center, you connect your data center, you start copying all the data into the appliance and you ship it back to our, um, our data centers. We copy all the data into S3 and make it available for your analysis, right? Uh, we also have a service called as the database migration service, which allows you to uh, connect to any on-premise databases and start uh, uh, migrating your data into AWS uh, databases, right? So you could use that to, for example, connect to your uh, OLTP systems and continuously uh, replicate the data into databases and data stores on the AWS platform. In addition, we also have got uh, multiple options to uh, ingest data from real-time uh, data sources, right? Uh, so here is a snapshot of all that options for uh, moving data from on-premise data centers. We spoke about Direct Connect, allowing you to establish uh, dedicated uh, network connection. We spoke about Snowball uh, to uh, order an appliance to ingest data from your on-premise data centers to AWS and database migration service. From a real-time uh, sources perspective, uh, again, there are multiple options for you depending upon uh, which are your data sources. If you have got a lot of IoT devices like your sensors in your factories, uh, they've got a, a platform, AWS IoT Core, uh, which allows you to seemingly seamlessly connect all your IoT devices uh, over both MQTT and HTTP protocols and start ingesting data from IoT devices into this platform, right? Um, if you're looking at um, ingesting data from mobile devices and uh, uh, server logs and so on and so forth, the Kinesis platform allows you to ingest data from those uh, different data sources right let's let's spend a little bit more time on uh, the kinesis platform which is uh, which allows you to ingest data from uh, data sources like your mobile devices and your uh, websites and servers and so on and so forth and start uh, processing the data in near real time right 
The first service that we offer is uh, Kinesis Data Streams. So using Kinesis Data Streams, what you could do is you could go to the service and spin up a, a fully managed streaming ingestion service and connect all your streaming sources, for example, your mobile devices and your servers, uh, and start ingesting all the data into Kinesis, right? Uh, what Kinesis does behind the scenes is that it automatically deploys infrastructure behind the scenes and deploys that infrastructure across multiple availability zones and starts collecting all that data in near real time and durably stores that data and allows multiple downstream applications to connect to the service and start processing the data again in near real time, right? So for example, you could uh, connect your mobile devices and start sending data in near real time into Kinesis. And on the other side, you could spin up, let's say, a Spark uh, cluster or let's say a Flink uh, cluster on EMR and start processing all the data in near real time. So that's for your near real time use cases, right? Um, the platform also offers a service called as Kinesis Data Firehouse, which allows again data to be ingested from various data sources. And the service automatically lands the data into specific destinations, right? So while Kinesis Data Streams allows you to connect any custom application and start processing the data in near real time, what Firehose allows you to do is to ingest data into Firehose and Firehose will automatically deliver the data into those four destinations that you see on the right-hand side, right? So from an ingest perspective, uh, we give you um, we give you an agent that you can deploy on, um, on any server or mobile devices, or uh, you could also hook up Firehose to your Kinesis streams if you already are ingesting to Kinesis streams, or if you are collecting data into, let's say, CloudWatch logs or CloudWatch events or our IoT platform, you could connect all of those into Kinesis Firehose, and Firehose will take all that data, and then Firehose will land the data into those four destinations, which are S3, Amazon Redshift, Amazon Elasticsearch Service, and Splunk. End-to-end, -end, fully managed, without you managing any infrastructure. In addition to delivering to those destinations, if you would want to perform any uh, transformations before data getting delivered into the destinations, Firehose provides Lambda integrations where uh, you could have a Lambda function. The function can have your own logic to basically, uh, let's say, do, perf or do some cleansing or perform some transformations. And then Firehose will deliver the data after those transformations happen into those four destinations, right? So Firehose will be the quickest and easiest way to collect uh, real-time data and deliver into those four destinations. The third service that is uh, available within the Kinesis platform is Kinesis Data Analytics, where the service allows you to run standard SQL queries against streaming data, right? So for example, if you're uh, sending streaming data into either Kinesis Data Streams or Kinesis Data Firehose, you could go to Kinesis Data Analytics and say, I have got my data being sent into Streams or Firehose. Here is my SQL. Run this streaming SQL against that data and give me the output of that, that data, right? So uh, as you, could, you could, for example, go to the service and say, um, uh, define uh, a SQL, which has, let's say, select um, uh, sum of uh, sales on the streaming data uh, and ca calculate that sum on a window of uh, one minute, right? So if you are streaming all your orders through Kinesis Streams or Firehose, then this particular uh, query would run on the streaming data and continuously calculate uh, sum of orders or sum of sales and then send that data into your near real-time dashboards, right? So if you are, let's say, more familiar with SQL and you don't want to, let's say, run write your own custom applications to process near real-time data, 
Kinesis Data Analytics allows you to give those SQL queries and run that against your streaming data and start processing the data. Right. So all these services fit under the near real time um, or real time um, space where you could use these services to ingest data in near real time and process the data in near real time. Right. So if I go back to that uh, diagram, so S3 nicely sits into that uh, sits at the center as a centralized uh, storage. And now you have got various ingestion options to ingest data. You could use Kinesis for your near real time uh, streaming data. You could use uh, Direct Connect for your connectivity and Snowball and the DMS for uh, replicating your data or migrating data from data centers to S3, right? So multiple choices there depending upon your use cases. So we looked at the collect anything aspect. Now let's move on to the next characteristics, which is the dive in anywhere. So how can you dive in at any granularity and start making uh, sense of your data? So one of the important challenges today is that uh, most customers think about data lake as just collecting data and durably storing it in a central location, right? Using something like S3. But what they tend to uh, forget is uh, what is called that uh, this uh, dark data, right? So while you're collecting a lot of data, how do you make sure that everyone in your organization has visibility into what data lives in your data lake, right? How do you make sure that they are able to discover what lives in your data lake and start making analysis out of your data, right? Uh, that's where AWS Glue comes into picture, where AWS Glue provides a centralized data catalog which allows you to discover data and make it available for people to perform analysis. So one of the things that Glue allows you to do is Glue allows you to crawl various data sources. So Glue has got built-in crawlers which can crawl various data sources, including Amazon S3 and databases that either run on-premise or on AWS and automatically extract schema and make it available in a centralized location within the glue catalog now the catalog maintains schema definitions which can further be leveraged by other aws services like your amazon emr athena and redshift all of them can centrally connect to that glue data catalog and infer the schema the important thing to note here is that the glue data catalog is a hive compatible catalog right so the underlying catalog is is a hive compatible meta store which means that any processing engine which can understand hive as the meta store can readily connect to glue so for example if you're running a spark cluster or a presto cluster which can readily connect to hive they can automatically connect to glue data catalog and start processing the data in this model you operate in a highly decoupled storage compute and catalog fashion where s3 becomes your centralized storage which is decoupled from your catalog so glue becomes your central catalog and then now you can use various compute engines that can go to the glue catalog infer the catalog and go back to s3 and start processing the data in addition to offering the catalog, Glue also offers an ETL service where you could go to the service and start, uh, let's say, defining your ETL pipelines. You could say, here is my source and here is my uh, destination and uh, uh, say that you want to perform this kind of a transformation. So Glue will automatically generate the ETL script, which you can further customize because it generates a Python script and there as a um, in-browser uh, editor through which you can go and edit the Python script that Glue generates for you. And then uh, once you're good enough with your script, you can save the script within Glue and uh, ask Glue to run that script as a job. You can define that as to be a job that runs in a particular frequency at a particular point in time of the day. And then G Glue makes sure that the job runs at that particular point in time and glue automatically maintains the infrastructure for the job it automatically runs the job on an infrastructure that is fully managed by glue so, and you are only charged for uh, the duration of your job if your job for example runs for 
20 minutes during the day you're only charged for those 20 minutes uh, of your job run right so absolutely no infrastructure to manage uh, everything is managed by glue and you only pay for how much uh, you use from an infrastructure perspective so again going back to the particular diagram so you got ingestion you got a central storage now you got the uh, the third aspect which is the catalog so glue becomes your uh, catalog which is your uh, metadata about your data and lives outside of your storage lives independent of your storage and allows any processing engine to connect to your uh, catalog right in addition if you want to let's say enrich that so what customers also do is um, uh, stream that catalog information to a nosql database or amazon elastic search which makes it um, uh, makes it good enough for uh, search right so people can go to let's say an elastic search and readily search your catalog as well right uh, and discover what lives in your data lake so we looked at um, the collect anything aspect we looked at the dive anywhere aspect and then the third characteristic is the flexible access mechanism right so before i dive into the flexible access mechanisms i want to talk a little bit about uh, this particular aspect of expanding access requirements right so gone are the days where uh, people uh, who are typically the business users uh, so they only tend to make those decisions but rather you've got like different personas coming up in your organization right while business users are still uh, making a lot of decisions through let's say dashboards you also have uh, folks like data analysts and data scientists who have different requirements and want to access the same data right so lots and lots of different personas who want uh, to access the same data but they want to access using different tools because for example the business user would like to go to a dashboard uh, which is more of a user interface and start slicing and dicing the data but a data analyst would probably want to uh, run sql queries against data a data analyst a data scientist on the other hand uh, probably wants to uh, leverage python and start analyzing the data right so they would want different tools different uh, engines to look at the data and the other aspect is they would want to again look at the data at different granularity the business user is probably looking at aggregated data set but a data scientist on the other hand is diving very deep and trying to build the machine learning models and so on and so forth right so that's where a lot of business operate today and your data lake should be able to cater to all these different types of uh, folks in your organization uh, so before i jump into that um, uh, I want to set a little bit more context in terms of the services, right? So uh, at AWS, we are not going to give you a single purpose tool which does uh, cater to all those different people. So we'll not give you like a Swiss Army knife which will give you uh, all sort of capabilities, but we are going to give you purpose-built tools which work great for a specific use case, right? So if that particular data analyst needs a SQL engine, we're going to give you a SQL engine which is specifically built for those use cases, right? So that's the uh, kind of approach that we would love to take, and we, you would see that we're going to give you multiple options to do to do those different use cases. The first uh, uh, service here is Amazon Redshift, which is a fully managed data warehousing as a service, right? So you could go to Amazon Redshift and spin up a uh, a large data warehouse in a matter of minutes which is fully managed by aws you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure and comes at typically one tenth of the cost of traditional data warehouse amazon redshift is a massively parallel processing engine where uh, behind the service you have got multiple uh, compute nodes which can operate in parallel uh, and operate against your data when you submit your queries to the service, uh, it uh, it computes the query execution plan and sends it down to multiple uh, compute nodes in the cluster, and all of them in parallel operate across your data. You can seamlessly scale from few gigabytes to all the way to uh, petabytes of data in the cluster. Right uh, underneath, uh, the data that is stored in Redshift is stored in a columnar format which is more suitable for analytical type of workloads and helps us reduce the um, amount of IO that you have to do. You could 
also store data in open data formats in S3 and use a feature called as Spectrum, which I'll talk about in a minute, to analyze data in open data formats. You could deploy the service uh, in a secured manner. Uh, you could deploy the service within your uh, virtual private cloud, within the AWS cloud, and you could uh, encrypt data in transit and at rest. The service is also compliant for all popular compliance requirements like your uh, PCA DSS, um, HIPAA, FedRAMP, and so on and so forth. And lastly, the service allows you to start small and scale as you want. You can start as low as $1,000 per terabyte per year, which is typically one-tenth of traditional data warehouses, and scale all the way from, from there to terabytes and exabytes of data. Uh, Amazon Redshift also has a, a feature called as Redshift Spectrum, which allows you to seamlessly extend your data warehouse to the S3 data lake. So using Spectrum, you could readily fire SQL queries against data sitting in Amazon S3 and start analyzing the data seamlessly. In this model, what you could do is you could keep certain portion of data within Redshift and certain data in S3 and seamlessly run analysis between both, the, both those data. You could have joins happening across your Redshift data and your S3 data lake. And the beauty of the Spectrum service is that you, you only pay whenever you use the service. If you're not firing a query that leverages Spectrum, you're not charged, right? So that's Amazon Redshift. And for your big data workloads, Amazon EMR uh, provides you uh, a fully managed service that allows you to quickly spin up uh, uh, a Hadoop cluster in a matter of minutes, right? So you could go to the service and say, I need a 100 node uh, Hadoop cluster. Uh, in this particular uh, instance type and so on and so forth. And the cluster gets spun up in a matter of minutes. Amazon EMR supports 19 different open source projects, including Spark, Presto, Hbase, Flink, Zeppelin, all those uh, projects that you typically use in the Hadoop ecosystem. You get the latest versions of all those open source projects. So we have a cadence where uh, uh, if, if something becomes uh, generally available in the, uh, in the open source community, it's available in EMR within 30 days of release. Amazon EMR also allows you to um, lower the cost of running big data workloads where you get per second billing for your clusters. And you also have integrations with uh, EC2 Spot. Uh, EC2 Spot is, uh, is a mechanism where you can access uh, the unused capacity in our data centers and it's typically available at 80 percent savings over your typical on-demand pricing right and third aspect is amazon emr directly can operate on top of your s3 data right you could spin up a spark cluster and a presto cluster which can seamlessly operate on data that is sitting out of your s3 bucket using emrfs so emrfs is EMR's own implementation of HDFS, which can directly connect to S3 and start running your analysis. In this model, you are decoupling the compute and storage of your Hadoop workload, where you can even spin up multiple EMR clusters and start running multiple analysis against the same data. If you are running, let's say, batch jobs that typically run once in a day, your cluster can come up whenever you need, let's say at 12 in the night and start running for let's say a couple of hours and then once your batch job is complete your cluster can be shut down and uh, you can again uh, run the same cluster again the next day right and you're only being charged only for those hours that your cluster was operational right it helps you reduce your overall cost of operating your hadoop workloads on amazon so that's emr for your hadoop workloads and we spoke about that other persona who wants uh, a SQL engine that they can readily use for performing analysis, those data analysts, right? So Amazon Athena is the next service which allows you to perform interactive queries written on standard SQL against data that is sitting on Amazon S3. So you can go to the service and say, here is my SQL query. 
run the SQL query against my S3 bucket. Absolutely no infrastructure setup, and you can query instantly on your data that is available on S3. The pricing model is pay per query, which means that if you run a query, that's when we charge you depending upon how much of data that you scan. And if you don't run any queries after that, you're no longer charged for that. Obviously you can save uh, a cost on that by compressing your data, keeping data in your columnar formats and so on and so forth. Uh, the type of queries that you write are standard ANSI SQL queries that um, you have written over many years. So there is nothing new to learn. And you can write any type of queries, including performing complex joins, uh, uh, window functions, and operating on complex data types, right? We also provide a JDBC ODBC driver, which means that you can connect to your favorite application. And from the application, you can start firing queries against your data set. The next service is uh, Amazon Elasticsearch service, which allows you to seamlessly deploy an Elasticsearch cluster on, and the service fully manages the underlying infrastructure for you, right? You can go to the service and say, I need a 10 node Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, we go and bring up the infrastructure. Uh, we manage the underlying infrastructure. We take care of availability, replacing node failures and all that heavy lifting and give you a single endpoint, a DNS endpoint to which uh, you can start connecting your applications and start firing your uh, queries against Elasticsearch. It's the same Elastic, it's the same open source Elasticsearch. So you have direct access to the Elasticsearch uh, APIs and, uh, uh, so, and comes with Kibana out of the box and Logstash out of the box, right? So you could start visualizing your uh, log data to Kibana in a matter of minutes. Um, security is taken care where you could deploy uh, the service within your VPC uh, you could uh, take care of encryption in transit and addressed uh, access policies to control who has access to your data, all that is available for you, right? So quickly uh, allows you to deploy an Elasticsearch service and start uh, running your analysis. So those are the uh, different processing engines, analytical engines that you have to start analyzing your data. So going back to that particular diagram, you now have those different engines that can readily connect to your S3 data lake and start processing your data and starting to make sense out of your data. On top of that, uh, you also get the highest levels of security. Uh, so we call security as job zero at Amazon. And if you have been an AWS user, you would have seen that we continue to uh, iterate and bring newer and newer capability from a security perspective, right? So lots and lots of options to secure uh, your data. Um, uh, so whether it is, let's say, uh, uh, things like encryption at rest, encryption in transit. Uh, there are multiple options there, so including a key management service for you. Uh, from an identity perspective, if you uh, want to control who has access to what, we provide a rich uh, identity and access management service. Um, we provide a directory service, which can connect to uh, your on-premise uh, active directories, or you could also deploy a fully managed active directory on the AWS platform. Um, if you need a web application firewall, we have a fully managed service for that. Uh, you could deploy everything within your uh, VPC, which is virtual private cloud, allows you to deploy uh, a, a private network within our AWS um, platform. And also from a compliance perspective, a number of compliance uh, uh, checks are also met by the platform, right? So you can be rest assured that when you're deploying your data lake, you can operate in a, a secured and a compliant manner on the platform. Specifically, I wanted to call out a newer service called as Amazon Maisie, which, um, which is a machine learning powered security service that continuously monitors your data that is available in your S3 data lake and generates alerts when it detects any unauthorized access to your data, right? Uh, it also recognizes any PII data. If you have, let's say, uh, if you do not want to if you did not intend to store any PAI data, if somebody accidentally puts a PAI data, the service can automatically detect that and start notifying you, right? So uh, lots of options uh, from a security perspective. So that's the next pillar from a data lake perspective. So use seemingly seamlessly all those different security services and protect your data that is sitting out of your S3 bucket. 
In addition, what customers also do is that if you would want to build your data lake and start exposing your data lake through APIs to both your internal organizations and your external users, um, we provide again multiple options to seamlessly deploy an API layer, right? So you could go to the uh, API gateway service and deploy an API in a matter of minutes and start exposing your data lake through APIs to your end users. So going back to those characteristics, so we covered the collect anything aspect, dive in anywhere and flexible access mechanisms. And lastly, future proofing. How do you make sure that your data lake is uh, future proof for all your new use cases? So when I, when I talk about future proof, a lot of customers are trying to look at uh, machine learning as a mechanism to drive richer insights and start predicting um, uh, data, pre predicting insights for your business, right? But if I, if we look at the machine learning process, it's extremely hard and time consuming today. So where you have to first collect all that data that makes sense to build your machine learning model, you have to go through a rigorous process to cleanse and format your data. And the whole exercise of training your machine learning model and retraining it and iterating it, it's very, very, cumbersome and you need access to a lot of uh, sophisticated users uh, expertise that is very hard to find right that's where the platform provides you uh, different capabilities to run your machine learning and ai uh, workloads from an ai perspective uh, there are lots of services available right from computer vision and text to speech and speech recognition and translation and natural language processing lots of fully managed services available as an API, right? So all these services are fully managed, available as an API, and you can readily consume these uh, services. In addition, we also have a service called a SageMaker, which allows you to quickly build out your machine learning models. Uh, you can go to the service and use um, a, a notebook to start building out your machine learning mo models, and then spin off a distributed training which we would fully manage from an infrastructure perspective. And once your models are built out, you could deploy that uh, through an endpoint on the service, again, full managed from an availability perspective and start paying for all the inferences in a per second model, right? So go and take a look at it. Um, it's, it's one of our uh, newer services and we see a lot of customers flocking to this for their machine learning and deep learning uh, use cases, right? So if I go back to the diagram, that fills the last uh, piece of the puzzle where uh, lots of choices from a machine learning and a deep learning perspective, right? Um, so hopefully that gave you a, a perspective in terms of how you could build out your data lake using all those uh, fundamental building blocks that we offer. So if you are more interested, uh, so we have a data lake solution which is available on our website. That's the link that is available where it's a reference architecture to build out all of that. You could go there and in one click, you can go and deploy that data lake on the AWS platform and readily get started from there, right? So if you are looking to build out your data lake, uh, what we recommend typically for our customers is to typically start with some projects where you can see some direct impact on your business. So shortlist some small projects that you're able to directly influence a, a business and then build out a very simple pipeline that will allow you to test your idea and start filling your data lake. And if you need help, please do reach out to us. Uh, so there are lots of solution architects through which uh, you can, we can help you build out your data lake and start uh, making those insights out of your data, right? With that, uh, I'm gonna introduce our guest speaker. Uh, so we have Vijay Chidambaram who heads cloud engineering at Manthan. Manthan is one of our uh, partners. They are an analytics ISV, and they have been one of our advanced users of the AWS platform, and specifically the uh, analytics platform, right? So Vijay is here to talk about how Manthan is leveraging the analytics platform uh, and how they have built out a data lake uh, to serve their business. Over to you, Vijay.
Hey, hi. Uh, uh, my name is Vijay Sarambaram. I head cloud engineering for Manthan. Um, thank you uh, for your participation. Uh, it's great to be talking to you about the Manthan Data Lake. Uh, what I'm going to do to start with is give you a quick introduction of Manthan, uh, and then we'll we'll talk more about the uh, the solution itself. Um, Manthan is a leading um, uh, cloud-based analytics company. Uh, we have pioneered analytic applications for customer-facing businesses. Uh, we have been in business for the last 14 years. Uh, in the last eight years or so, we have um, radicalized the way we have offered our analytical solutions on the cloud, more so with what we have done with AWS. Um, all of our solutions are based on um, very strong um, decision sciences, advanced math, and artificial intelligence, all of them powered natively by the AWS stack, so to speak. Um, we are very well recognized by the experts. Um, our collaboration with AWS spans over eight years now. Uh, we've been widely recognized by them as innovation partners uh, two years in the road now, um, and uh, highly rated and highly commented by most of the experts in the market. Um, so that was a very quick introduction um, of, of Manthan for the guys who have not been initiated or not aware of who Manthan is. Um, so what we're going to really jump into is the Manthan's uh, version of the data lake on the AWS cloud. Um, and as you see, um, what we like to see it, uh, from a vision perspective or from, from the promise of what we deliver to our customers is basically a hyperscale repository of enterprise and external data optimized for AI and analytical workloads. Uh, this is a very important um, guiding principle for us of how we designed a data lake on AWS. Predominantly, what we've been hearing from our customers are the fact that um, the analysis of data generated by enterprises themselves or internal business systems, uh, for example, your ERPs, or your finance systems, your, your transactional systems, uh, has pretty much reached the ceiling. Right, where you're looking at um, uh, where you're looking at business objectives which are improving by say about uh, five to six percent, um, getting in external data, data that you don't really generate, which is basically generated um, on the cloud, in the internet space, on social media, on weather syndicates, um, um, on other CDP platforms, for example, and other loyalty programs and and, uh, and omni-channel interfaces like e-commerce. That's the data that uh, enterprises are looking to bring in, and that's the data that they have seen uh, enrich their uh, business insights that much more, uh, leading to uh, uh, far greater realization of business objectives. So that's what got us really started in, in, in what we wanted to build our, our version of the data lake on AWS. Um, so what we have engineered um, is basically um, the out-of-box engineer to scale uh, designed to deliver insights that drive business objective. Very clearly, we are not focused on uh, the mechanics of building the data lake or bringing all data and collecting the data. We are not focused merely on modernizing your data, uh, your data platform. What we are interested in, what we have delivered through Amazon is actually a data lake that can allow you um, to go and achieve those business objectives that you set. Uh, to that extent, you should have, we have built the capability of bringing in all of the data, all of the non-enterprise data, social media data, e-commerce, IoT, unstructured, unstructured, um, um, and uh, also leverage uh, the best of uh, the AWS technology to drive uh, the most economical and most probably the most resilient data store. Um, we built a large uh, catalog in search mechanism that, that's extremely important uh, because while you have all of this data, you also need to have a very strong capability of going and looking for the data that you actually need. Uh, we also need that uh, to drive a lot of compliance, a lot of data lineage uh, concepts, which are also very important from a governance perspective on the data lake. And of course, the end objective is the data lake that Manthan is built on AWS is designed to satisfy these various personas, your data sciences, your advanced business analytic users, um, who run advanced algorithms and predictive algorithms. So essentially what we bring um, on AWS to our customers is an end-to-end -end solution out of the box, right from data ingestion, collection, storage, uh, to the way we manage the data in the various stages that we will talk through in the subsequent slides. And of course, um, having those end consumers consume the data in those various ways. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so again, 
The approach we have taken, and this is something that we have seen work for us, uh, is the fact that uh, you can stage the way you build your data lake. You can stage the journey that you take in building the data lake. Uh, the primary or the, maybe the, the keystone aspect of any data lake is probably ingest the data, collect any anything anywhere, um, and store it in a scalable, resilient manner. That's probably the base foundation layer. Um, whether it's batch data, whether it's real-time data, um, whether it's operational, technical, business metadata as well, um, and store it in a manner which can scale, which is extremely res uh, resilient, and which al also offers you uh, ease of management, ease of data lifecycle management. And, um, and then segment the data in a fashion that basically takes care of the needs of the various consumers. That's probably the fundamental um, underlying keystone of how we build a data lake. And on top of that, you can then progress to the next part, part of your data lake journey, which is enabling the different consumers to come into play, uh, whether it is AI and machine learning, um, which probably tends to more um, uh, use the concepts of uh, schema on, on reads, um, which is early life cycle analytics without really having the burden of um, uh, large scale uh, final view transformations. Uh, so that's probably the next journey that we have seen work for our customers and uh, seen work for us. And then the final uh, end point is what we refer to as the transform data lake, which allows a whole slew of consumer services to come in. Uh, this could be self-service analytics, it could be a deep visualization, advanced visualizations, and it also could be like conversational agents which allow uh, voice and uh, text AI tools to actually integrate the data. Another big trend that we are seeing is a lot of our customers who have invested in the data lake have also started to monetize what that investment. Uh, we're running data monetization service. A big part of what we offer to our customers is an ability of um, actually dipping into it, this data through a data API, through API calls, uh, which not only allow them to get fast access to the data, relatively loosely coupled, uh, but also they, uh, they, we have seen them uh, kind of monetize this ability uh, across um, the implementations that we have done. So largely, layer this down into a journey, uh, start with the fundamental keystone, which is going to future-proof you, and then you can keep adding capabilities as they emerge. You can also keep bringing in the data from the various business needs as they emerge. One of the key aspects for us is how we have structured the lake itself. You know. Uh, Raghu talked very extensively about the injection, so I'm not going to really dwell with the capabilities of injection. I think that was very well covered. What I would like to share with you guys is uh, the way we have structured the entire storage mechanism or the entire storage element. Uh, largely, we have classified it or segmented into uh, three zones or three data zones, as uh, we would like to call it. Um, to start with, uh, you push all of the data as native as possible, as granular as possible, in something that we refer to as the landing zone. Um, really, there's no transformation. You're not bringing any kind of DQ. You're not bringing any kind of cleansing mechanisms over here. You're just aggregating data into one place. You're just pushing in data and pulling in data, ingesting it, and have it have it available for further processing in one place. Uh, this data is going to be largely transient because once you have worked on it, you probably don't want it to be in the landing zone. The next stage that we progress the data through is the raw data zone. Um, again, largely native in format, but we do now bring the capability of organizing this. Uh, the need for us to do that is basically it also helps a lot of the governance aspects. Uh, you can put stricter access privileges around this by just structuring the data. Um, it helps you construct your bucket policies and your least access privileges and basically start governance from that point of view in terms of who got access to the data, who can put in data, who can pull out data, right? Um, and then this is then transition to the curated data zone. Um, this is where things get interesting, right? This is where you want to be investing most of your DQ techniques. Uh, this is where you want to be performing your deduplications, your outlier rejections, your missing value injections. A lot of harmonization capabilities come through over here. Uh, this is probably the data zone where a lot of schema on read workloads are served out of, right? And this is where probably, um, and as we do, uh, is where we structure it into probably uh, analytically friendly structure from a, maybe an open file structure to maybe a parquet structure, which is more columnar in nature and, 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 tend, and lends itself better for uh, schema on read analytics. This is where probably you want 
most of your data science workloads to be dipping into the data. This is where you want probably all of your uh, ad hoc data discovery and ad hoc querying capabilities to be served out. Uh, okay. So that's the, uh, the kind of definition that we have um, of the curated data zone. And the final one, which is the transform data zone, is largely an optional uh, segmentation that you can do within the data lake. Um, I'm saying optional for the lack of any other word, uh, but this is a data zone which gets created uh, knowing exactly what those consumers want and how they want it to be served off, right? You're probably looking at people who want to do visualization. So you need to have an aggregated uh, data mart, so to speak. Uh, and that's when you probably would end up leveraging something like Redshift to run this kind of a workload. So this is the final transformation. This is when you are bringing in uh, business specialization. You're bringing in uh, line of business controls in terms of how the data has to be structured, transformed, aggregated, and served out to a very specific niche uh, set of consumers. Right? And across the board, uh, we have uh, catalogs maintained in Glue. And I was spoke up, uh, about Glue and the ability for us to have a universal data catalog across the varying consuming um, uh, entities, uh, be it EMR, be it Redshift, be it Athena, uh, is what uh, drew us to have a universal catalog on, on Glue. And of course, um, we also have the lifecycle management kick in. Um, then, um, uh, and we have those rules configured, which basically allows you to archive data, which is no longer hot or no longer um, in the recency that you basically want to spend on, uh, on an active storage. Uh, so that's the archive. Uh, zone, so to speak. So that's essentially how we have structured our, uh, our data lake, uh, how we have segmented this. Largely, um, the deciding factor is the readiness of uh, analytics that the data in each one of these zones uh, lends to. Here is a, is a complete end-to-end -end view, um, a logical view of how uh, we move in data into the data lake. Um, how do what is the the different ingestion mechanisms that are part of our ingestion factory? Um, the landing zone. What do we do after the landing zone? What do we do within the various uh, different zones? Be it the raw data zone, curated zone, and transform data zone. Uh, if you look at the ingestion factory, um, so uh, all of our um, uh, wrappers, whether they call it the month and real time ingestion factory, is basically our um, a differentiation over the native uh, uh, services that AWS offers, be it Canisys or be it uh, Canisys Data Firehose, right? Uh, similarly, uh, for the month in IoT, we use uh, AWS IoT, so to speak. We have got our own differentiators on top of that, um, as, well as, as well as the Data API service, so to speak, right? Um, of course, the batch data, which is going to be predominantly the use case uh, that you will drive, uh, will be supported by the likes of Snowball, um, AWS Direct Connect, um, and even accelerated S3 endpoints. Um, so we spoke about the, the month and landing zone, we spoke about the raw data zone and what we do. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about the consumers that we have built as part of the solution out of the box. We have the month and data API, uh, largely um, data partnerships, data monetization, data collaboration across the enterprise to other enterprise entities are something that uh, support for example, uh, in, in a case of a CPG, uh, he probably wants to be looking at um, retailers dip into his data link and draw that information that he probably has got, which is valuable to them, right? Then you also have the month and MI and AI servers largely powered by AWS SageMaker. Um, and uh, we have advanced analytical workbenches, uh, machine learning workbenches that allow the data science community within our customers to readily go there, execute model. Uh, execute score the models and uh, driver inferences. And of course, we also have the pre-packaged Panthen Analytics platform, uh, but you can then bring any other platform to the data lake, so to speak. Uh, visualization tools like Tableau are a great example of how we have seen some of our customers actually uh, bring in, plug in the tool, bolt on to the capabilities, probably hit the transform data zone more than anything else and run their visualization, right? And we can also have third-party applications dip into the system so largely the way we have structured this is is bearless have a loosely coupled ingestion layer and a loosely coupled coupled uh, consumer layer uh, basically takes care of the varying uh, emerging business enterprise so here's a quick snapshot of some of 
uh, the the AWS services that we have leveraged. Um, we have used we've used Amazon Accelerator S3 endpoints for batch loads very extensively. We have used Snowball. Uh, we've also used uh, Amazon DMS services. Uh, for curation and file structuring, we run um, Spark Hive on Hadoop, uh, predominantly on uh, Amazon EMR. Uh, catalog management and search capability is something that we have built out of Glue uh, and Amazon Elasticsearch. Uh, Ethan has allowed us to open up a lot of data discovery, ad hoc querying, serverless SQL capabilities on the data lake. Our deep data APIs are built uh, of DynamoDB, where we have a lot of, a lot of very extremely responsive uh, request to response um, um, kind of workloads are met. We flatten the data or have it on a NoSQL like DynamoDB, um, have a Redis implementation on Elastic Cache and fronted by an API gateway. That's a pretty standard implementation that we have on AWS. Our machine learning workbenches are powered by SageMaker in the background. Uh, some of our NLP and NLU capabilities, we have used Lex and Poly as part of uh, the services as well. And of course, for specialized big data warehouses, we use Redshift. In some cases, we've also extended Redshift into uh, Amazon Spectrum, right? A um, lot of our um, process orchestration, because there's a lot of process orchestration, there's a lot of uh, automation that you have to bring into the entire ecosystem within the data lake. Uh, we use a proprietary tool called Month and Data Sync, uh, but then it largely relies on a lot of S3 events and uh, Lambda functions that we have uh, very uh, uh, specifically written for what we offer in the data lake. Of course, the foundational service, which is, which is Amazon S3, that's the, the, the keystone for the entire data lake design that Manthan has evolved around uh, AWS. So what I'm going to do is quickly walk through a couple of use cases, uh, successful use cases that we have uh, brought to our customers. Uh, the first one is the consolidated platform of marketing, advertising, analytics for a global telecommunication conglomerate. Now we're looking at about uh, 20, data from 20 million uh, set-top boxes uh, across about uh, 12 million households. Um, um, again, the project scope was uh, to, to create a secure data platform and allow a single view of customer across internal and external data sources, right? And um, what the scope of data was, was ad viewership across 20 million set-top boxes, that's 12 million households. CRMs, calls, call center data, transactional data, and external data as well. So this basically was the data scope. Just to give you some numbers in terms of what data and volumes you're looking at, uh, the lake is basically a 100 TB data lake. 55% of that uh, is structured around um, S3. Um, and we have various components like Athena, um, Amazon Spectrum, then allow the querying capability of that, uh, that structure. About 25% of um, uh, data is then structured into uh, highly uh, non-persistent Hadoop clusters, which allow a lot of Spark and high workloads to be processed. And another 20% of the data is actually on um, a Redshift data warehouse, which is then powering a lot of their uh, canned report use cases, visualization, and uh, aggregated dashboards. Uh, so this is a good example of how each one of the data zones has been orchestrated to work in unison to drive a business objective. Um, again, a few tenants over here, security being very important because we're actually co co collecting a lot of customer sensitive data. Um, multiple security gates, all the deployments are within a virtual private cloud. Um, we do a lot of pre-transfer encryption. That is another recommendation that we give to our customers is encrypt pre-transfer into us. And it is, of course, uh, encrypted at rest with our server-side uh, encryption on S3 as well as on, on, on Redshift as such. Um, very compelling cost to scale ratio, which we have achieved by, by literally constructing this entire thing of AWS S3. Um, scale infinitely with very high resilience. Um, all of our Hadoop clusters, and again, this is an important part, wherever you can use disposable resources, non-persistent uh, resources within the uh, data lake, uh, go ahead and do that. We run a lot of non-persistent Hadoop clusters to do some of our uh, our uh, analytics on, on, on the data lake. Um, uh, hybrid MPP based uh, concise data mart, driving a lot of uh, advanced visualization for the customer, um, and literally a true um, order scale architecture across all of the elements, whether it's storage or the Hadoop cluster, uh, whatever consuming application servers and the ingestion servers per se. So very good use case, basically covering all aspects of what Raghu and I have, have spoken so far. Uh, 
just run through one more uh, before we uh, we wrap up and open for questions. Uh, this is a different kind of a business. We're talking about uh, a large uh, conglomerate, nation conglomerate, uh, retailer uh, specializing across grocery, fashion, and um, home and white good appliances. Um, again, big big driver for um, varied data sources, uh, both external and internal. Uh, 800 plus stores across about 240 uh, cities, so they really generate a lot of a lot of uh, data uh, internally as well as, uh, as, as external, um, externally. Again, a good quick snapshot of the numbers that we are talking about here. Um, so, uh, whoa, there are about uh, 35 million plus customers. Customers in terms of uh, customers associated with with this particular uh, conglomerate. Uh, um, about uh, 13 different type of loyalty programs that are I kind of pumping in data into the data lake. A uh, uh, lot of transactions that happen throughout the day. Um, it's a 40 TB data lake. And what we have seen is from when we, we implemented this data lake and in its current state, this data lake has kind of slowly morphed itself into being a, a CDP or a customer data platform. Now that's an interesting observation that has happened is you end up building a data lake, but you see the data lakes that we have built specialized into one of to uh, form factors. We have seen data lakes completely specialize themselves into being uh, data monet uh, monetization platforms. In this case, we have seen this data lake kind of morph itself into being a, a customer data platform. So literally, a well-architected data lake uh, with the ability uh, uh, to consume um, infinite uh, uh, data at, at scale um, with the right set of tools available to uh, customers will see you differentiate very quickly into very specific uh, usage patterns around the data lake. Uh, see that much more business value rather than being a kind of an academic mechanics of uh, aggregating data or modernizing your data platform. So that's kind of the uh, the, the emerging trend that we have seen. Uh, but the fact remains that you, you architect it right, you architect it for scale, and you architect it for being future-proof. Uh, so that's that's what I wanted to share uh, with you guys. Uh, you can look up Manthan at www.manthan.com. Um, um, my email ID will be shared to you guys. And um, please feel um, to uh, touch base with me. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Raghu, for questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vijay. Uh, that was very, very insightful. Um, uh, so we'll do. Uh, uh, we do have a few questions coming up over the uh, Q&A window. Uh, I'll try to answer as much as possible. Keep keep sending uh, any more questions uh, till we hit the 12:30 mark. Uh, the first question uh, is uh, is about. Um, uh, 